All right, everybody, welcome to chapter 1.4 on membrane transport. So in other words, how do we get molecules into and out of cells? Okay, so in terms of molecular movement, we have two very basic categories here, okay? So we have passive transport and we have active transport. In passive transport, particles are moving from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. So we often say that they're moving down the concentration gradient because they're going from high to low or down the concentration gradient. Now, that doesn't mean physically down, okay? That just means they're going from where it's really crowded to where it's not as crowded. And this does not require the input of energy. On the other hand, active transport is a movement of particles from areas of low concentration to high concentration. And we say that that is against or up the concentration gradient. And that requires ATP. You see, what's happening here is molecules are always in motion. And so when molecules are really crowded, they're likely to run into each other more often. And when they run into each other, they're going to bounce off. And they're going to bounce off into areas where it's not as crowded. So that process, moving from areas of high concentration to low concentration, does not require extra input of energy. That's just happening uh, normally, naturally. When you try to go the other way around, when you try to push molecules from where they're really crowded, or sorry, really spread out until where they're really crowded, that's not something that happens normally. So you're going to have to put energy into that movement. And that energy is usually gonna be in the form of a molecule called ATP. Don't worry if you don't know what that is right now, <laughs> you will later. Great, so it's also worth noting some examples of each of these types of transport. So we have passive transport, and that's going to include diffusion, also sometimes referred to as simple diffusion. We have facilitated diffusion and osmosis. In terms of active transport, we have protein pumps, endocytosis, and exocytosis. All right, so let's talk about passive transport for a moment, okay? Oftentimes, um, people get confused between simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion, okay? And I'll tell you, it's a classic IV trick to try to trick you into thinking that this process is an active process. So before we talk about the differences, let's go back and talk about the similarities. First of all, they're both passive, meaning that there is no energy required. They both move molecules from areas of high concentration to low concentration or down the concentration gradient. So they are both forms of passive transport. Now, here's the difference between them. In diffusion, okay, when we're talking about cells, okay, then simple diffusion just moves particles between the layers of the phospholipids, okay? In facilitated diffusion, so here's simple, here's facilitated, okay? In facilitated diffusion, those particles are still moving from areas of high concentration to low concentration, but they're going through carrier proteins. It does not require the input of energy. It's just requiring a protein because whatever these molecules are, uh, are either polar um, or ionic. They don't jive with these little uh, hydrophobic tails or they're just too big, okay? So I wanna go back for a minute and talk about this process of simple diffusion. It is totally possible to have simple diffusion uh, without a membrane. So let's say I put a sugar cube into uh, a cup of water here. What's gonna happen is those sugar molecules are eventually going to spread out, okay? Movement from high concentration to low concentration. That's simple diffusion. It does not require a membrane. Facilitated diffusion, on the other hand, 
definitely requires a membrane because we said facilitated diffusion is the movement through these carrier proteins. Okay, so in just a cup of water, we don't have carrier proteins, so that doesn't make any sense. Okay, we have to have carrier proteins in order for something to move via facilitated diffusion. So we say that simple diffusion could occur with a membrane, but it doesn't have to. So it could occur with or without a cell membrane. Okay, facilitated diffusion, on the other hand, definitely requires a membrane. However, don't get confused. They are both moving from areas of high concentration to low concentration down the concentration gradient without the input of energy. Okay, it's just that they're doing it in slightly different ways. Okay, so let's, before we move into this other process called osmosis, which can be confusing and horrible, okay, let's talk about molecular movement and plan A and plan B. Let's look at this scenario here, okay? In this scenario, I have some kind of solute, so these purple thingies here, let's say these are glucose molecules, okay? And we can easily see that there's an area of high concentration of glucose, and a low concentration of glucose. Well, plan A is always for simple diffusion to take place, okay? If there were uh, a way for some of these glucose molecules just to move to where it's less crowded, then that's what they would be doing. Simple diffusion would take place. If we have a scenario where that's not uh, an available option for them, then we're gonna get this process called osmosis. You see, what I see happening here is this semi-permeable membrane is for some reason not allowing these glucose molecules to move to the other side. And we're maintaining some type of high concentration and low concentration. Well, that's not okay. So what's gonna happen here is some of this extra water on this side is gonna move over to this side to help give the glucose molecules that are really crowded more room to spread out, okay? And that ends up in equal concentration. So notice that in the after picture, okay, that there's still more glucose over here than there is over here, but now the concentrations are the same, okay? And that's due to the movement of water, and we call that osmosis. So the os uh, definition of osmosis, and you must know this, is the passive movement of water across a semi-permeable membrane. So you need to commit that definition to memory. Simple diffusion, okay, is the movement of molecules from an area of high concentration to low concentration and I'm going to abbreviate that because my handwriting is awful, movement of molecules from an area of high concentration to low concentration. It does not require a membrane. It doesn't have to go in and out of cells. Okay, osmosis, on the other hand, definitely requires a membrane. See, because without a membrane here, then just simple diffusion would have taken place. These would have spread out over here. Okay, so osmosis is only going to occur when there's a membrane and water has to do the moving in order for those uh, concentrations to even out. Now, with uh, osmosis, we often have several terms that we use to describe different solutions on either side of a membrane. And these words are kind of like com uh, other comparative words. So things like taller, or smarter, or faster, okay? I don't just say, ooh, I'm taller. Okay, well, taller than who? So you have to be specific about what you're comparing things to. All right, hypotonic. This word hypo means below, okay? And tonic refers to concentration. So here, this word literally means Okay, something that has a concentration that is lower or below. And hypotonic is a word used to describe a solution 
that has a lower concentration of solutes. So here, let's say this blue part represents some kind of a solution and this orange part represents some kind of a cell. Here we would say the cell is sitting in a hypotonic solution. Or another way you can say it is the solution is hypotonic compared to the cell because it has a lower concentration of solutes. Let's say these green things represent things like glucose that can't pass through a semi-permeable membrane, okay? Then we would say this is a hypotonic solution. All right, this prefix iso means same, okay? And so an isotonic solution is one where the concentration of solutes in the solution is the same as the concentration of solutes uh, on the other side of the membrane or perhaps in the cell, okay? And then a hypertonic solution uh, is a little bit different. Hypertonic means above, okay? So the concentration is higher. So here's what a hypertonic solution looks like. The concentration of solutes is higher in solution than it is in the cell. Now, in terms of uh, molecular movement, okay, we can use these words and pictures to kind of predict the movement of molecules. Now, this again is only going to happen if these green things here are stuck in the cell, okay? If these green things could pass through the cell membrane, then just simple diffusion would take place and wherever we have a higher concentration, some of them would move into areas of lower concentration. But let's say that that is not the case. Let's say that they are stuck where they are. What we can do is use their scenarios to predict the movement of water. So in an isotonic solution, there is no need for water to move anywhere because the concentrations are already the same. So I'm gonna get no net movement, okay, of water. In a hypotonic solution, again, these solutes want to move out of the cell, they just can't because they are stuck. So in this case, water is gonna do the moving. And I'm gonna notice the net movement of water into the cell. Some of this extra water is going to move into the cell, giving these solutes more room to spread out. So kind of blowing up that cell with water. In a hypertonic solution, again, these green solutes can't move. Okay, so what's gonna happen is some of the extra water from the cytoplasm of the cell is going to exit the cell to try to give these green solutes more volume to uh, move around in until the concentrations are the same. Okay, so in a hypertonic solution, water is leaving the cell. In a hypotonic solution, water would enter the cell. Okay, so let's say that I'm culturing some tissues in a Petri dish. Let's say I'm culturing some tissues, some stem cells uh, to treat Stargardt's disease. Remember that? That's the one where we use stem cells to grow new retinal cells for people suffering from Stargardt's disease. Uh, and that's where their uh, retinal cells can't absorb vitamin A and they go blind. Anywho, okay, the cells that we have in our Petri dish must constantly be bathed uh, in an isotonic solution. So that means that whatever the solution my cells are in, the concentration of solutes must be the same inside the cell and outside the cell, okay? And that's because we don't really want a whole bunch of water going into the cell or out of the cell, okay? We don't want our cells shrinking and shriveling up. We don't want our cell blowing up with water. We don't want any of those scenarios. Okay, so we need to keep that in an isotonic solution. Okay, now I've been alluding to the fact that in that glucose example, okay, 
those glucose solutes couldn't move across the membrane. Okay, I kept saying that they wanted to move across the membrane, but they just couldn't. They were getting stuck. So what is it that determines whether things can move across the cell membrane easily? Well, those two things are size and charge, okay? So uh, things that are small or nonpolar move very easily across the membrane. So things like oxygen, carbon dioxide, really small things that don't have a charge. If I have something that is large, like a glucose molecule, or polar, or I should say has a charge, so something like ion, sodium, potassium, chlorine, whatever, that's going to be very difficult to move across the membrane. Okay, so that kind of explains why here in this example, these glucose molecules weren't able to move across the membrane. They were too big. Okay, glucose is also polar, so that's two strikes against it. And that was why in that example, extra water from the solution had to move in Okay, and undergo osmosis. So osmosis is one of those things uh, that we rely heavily upon in our kidneys. Now, let's say your kidneys uh, aren't working. So during times of kidney failure, which is one of the um, kind of secondary symptoms of diabetes and other diseases, uh, your kidneys just don't function properly anymore, okay? They're worn out. And our kidneys are the ones responsible for removing excess waste, excess water, extra uh, salt, and other toxins. And if they're not working anymore, then what's going to happen is our blood plasma is no longer isotonic to our blood cells, okay? And so when that happens... Wow, bad things could happen. Either extra water could rush into the cell, extra water could rush out of the blood cells, or blood cells could pop, or blood cells could shrivel. All that is really bad. Okay, so we need our kidneys to constantly keep our blood plasma isotonic to our blood cells. Okay, when our kidneys aren't able to do that anymore, what we do is we put them through dialysis machines. Okay, and dialysis machines are kind of acting like our kidneys, okay? They have several filters, several membranes in there that make sure uh, that we can filter things out, that we can uh, undergo osmosis to the point where our uh, blood plasma is isotonic to our blood cells. Okay, so before we move into active transport, okay, let's just do a little quick review here. We know that it requires energy, and that energy is usually in the form of ATP, so adenosine triphosphate. To get that energy out of ATP, we break a bond to release that chemical energy. We need that chemical energy because we're working against the concentration gradient. So whereas in simple diffusion, areas of high concentration, we're seeing particles move from there into areas of low concentration, in active transport, we're going the other way around. We are moving particles from an area of low concentration to an area where they're already highly concentrated, and that requires energy, okay? This is really important because it allows cells to maintain an unequal concentration gradient. See, in nature, molecular motion dictates that they want those um, concentration gradients to always be equal, but there are many examples where our cells need to maintain unequal gradients, where we need one side to be higher than the other. More on that in a minute. Okay, so our examples here are protein pumps like the sodium potassium pump. Boy, you're going to hear that about a gajillion times throughout this course. And endocytosis and exocytosis. Okay, so let's take a look at a specific protein pump and um, how that actually works in your body. Lots of cells, including your nerve cells, rely on this thing called the sodium potassium pump. And this word pump is a dead giveaway that this is an example of active transport that I am going against the concentration gradient and that this requires energy in the form of ATP. Okay, so here's how this works. 
First of all, we're only using a specific protein. Different molecules require different pumps. Proteins have specific shapes. They only work for specific uh, molecules and reactions. Okay, so here's the inside of my cell. Here's the outside. Okay, first step is that three sodium ions, one, two, three, are going to bind to this particular protein pump. Then we're going to release the energy from ATP by breaking off that third phosphate group, okay? And then we're using that breaking of that bond to release energy, okay? So I'm putting in some kind of energy into this protein pump here. When you add in that energy from ATP, it causes the protein to change its shape, okay? So it kind of squeezes this shape here and ejects these three sodium ions. So now the sodium has gone from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell, okay? So that energy causes the protein to change its shape and it ejects those three sodium ions to the outside of the cell. But we're not done yet. You see, because waiting for us on the outside of the cell are two uh, potassium ions, okay? Now, when that protein changed its shape to squeeze out these three sodium ions, okay, what it also did is it changed its shape to allow two so or two potassium ions to bind to the other side of the protein. Okay? Now, when these potassium ions bind to the protein, it's again going to cause a slight change in the shape of the protein and it causes this carrier protein to kind of spit out this uh an organic phosphate group, okay? So that phosphate group that we broke off of ATP. When that phosphate group is kind of ejected from that carrier protein, that's going to cause our two potassium ions to be ejected from that protein. So it kind of squeezes its shape again and ejects those potassium ions into the cell. Okay, so uh, many people kind of remember this as toucan, okay, like the bird, even though this doesn't make any sense to me, I hear a lot of people saying it, and they remember that as toucan, toucan, okay, toucan, two potassium ions, here they are, into the cell, okay, and so this is an example of how protein pumps work. So again, I know I must be pushing things against the concentration gradient. If sodium ions are moving out of the cell, that must mean that there was already a pretty high concentration of them over here. That's why that required the input of energy. If potassium ions are moving into the cell, that must mean I probably already had a pretty high concentration of them inside the cell. So I'm going against the concentration gradient on either side, and that's why this requires energy in the form of ATP. So here's another look at this kind of all together. Okay, so we've got our three uh, sodium ions moving out. The ATP causes the change in shape here, and it causes that protein to eject those three sodium ions. Okay, when that phosphate group breaks off, the two potassium ions that had bound to the protein are ejected into the cell. Now, even though this is the most, um, oh, I don't know, famous example that we talk about, the sodium-potassium pump isn't the only example of a membrane pump. Another great example that you should probably know um, are the membrane pumps in the liver cells. Your liver has a lot of of jobs, okay? 
one of the jobs has to do with removing glucose from the blood, okay? So let's say that I just ate a meal and there are lots of glucose molecules in my bloodstream. Well, we can't have that because in your blood uh, is also a bunch of red blood cells. And if the concentration of glucose is higher in your blood than in your blood cells, okay, then we're going to have a problem. That means a lot of this water in your, uh, that's already in your blood cells might leave and enter uh, your bloodstream to even out those concentrations, and then your red blood cells are going to shrivel up. So this is why high blood, close, uh, blood glucose levels in diabetics is so terrible. All right, well, now let's say that in your liver cells, you already have a high concentration of glucose. Let's say all of these black dots here are glucose granules, okay? And I'm just highlighting them in blue since that's what I did to your uh, blood glucose levels in your blood. Now, if this were the case, then these liver cells really don't want any more glucose, Okay, they already have a higher concentration than your blood levels do. Okay, that is no good. All right, what we're going to have to do is use membrane pumps to pump okay, these extra glucose molecules into your liver cells. Again, going against the concentration gradient, going from where they're already relatively low to where they're already relatively high is going to take the addition of ATP and a membrane pump. Okay, so let's look at um, a couple other forms of transport here, okay? Now that we're done with membrane pumps, I think we've beat that horse to death, um, let's take a look at something called endocytosis. Okay, cyto means cell, endo means inside. So here we are moving something inside of a cell, okay? And this is going to happen when we need to move something that is pretty large, okay? So what happens here, uh, when we want to move a large group of molecules or large molecules in general, what your cells are so awesome. What they can do is kind of make a dent in their cell membrane, and they kind of make a little pouch for these molecules. Then that pouch kind of pinches together and pushes together. This is where the active part comes in, where we need ATP, because these parts have to push together. And what's so awesome about your cell membrane is those hydrophobic interactions are so strong that they can literally merge together so that these tails don't have to touch the water inside or outside of the cell, okay? And they literally become one solid part of the cell. And what's happening here is when this part pinches together, it kind of closes off this part, and this forms what we call a vesicle. Okay, so you may want to go ahead and label that a vesicle. And now we have what we wanted to ingest or move into the cell. Okay, inside of our cell, our cell membrane is back intact and it's wrapped in something called a vesicle. We have two different types of endocytosis. Okay, so these are both types of endo cytosis, okay? And we have uh, two types again. So pinocytosis, okay, means literally cell drinking. So that pino means to drink. Uh, I remember this from like Pinot Noir, a type of wine. You're probably too young to know what I'm talking about, but that's okay. Um, and that's the uptake of extracellular fluids. So if I need to ingest a large amount of fluids, probably with dissolved nutrients, I'm gonna do that by pinching them off and forming a vesicle. So that's pinocytosis. The word phago means to eat. 
So this is when I'm literally doing cell eating. I'm intaking um, large particles. Let's say you're a white blood cell and your job is to ingest or eat up pathogens, bad guys, like germs, like bacteria, okay? What can happen here is that I can literally make a dent in my cell membrane and kind of cause that solid particle, like the bacteria, the pathogen, to move into that dent, and I can pinch off that cell uh, membrane and form a vesicle around that pathogen. That's called phagocytosis. So now it's inside my cell, inside a vesicle. Okay, now the same kind of process happens in exocytosis, only we're going the other way around. So again, cyto means cell, exo means outside, okay? Like bugs have an exoskeleton, their skeleton is on the outside. And the way that that works is that our Golgi apparatus here is going to take proteins or other materials produced by the cell and it is going to wrap them in a vesicle, okay? Oh, we've heard of that word before. The vesicle, again, is made up of the same materials as the cell membrane, okay? So once it wraps it in a vesicle, that vesicle kind of gets pushed up against the cell membrane and this part fuses with this part, okay, kind of releasing those materials to the outside. So when, when we're talking about the function of the Golgi, the function of the Golgi is to wrap materials in vesicles for transport outside the cell. Okay, so for transport out of the cell. In fact, this word vesicle is so important to the function of the Golgi that on many of the IB mark schemes, if you're asked for the uh, to state the function of the Golgi apparatus, you will not get marks unless you mention this word vesicle. If you're asked to draw the Golgi, you will not get marks unless you include the vesicles. Okay, so make sure that you're kind of keeping that in mind there. Now, the tough part about uh, endo and exocytosis is that they both kind of create temporary holes in cell membranes. Okay, the good news, like I said earlier, is that the hydrophobic nature of these tails uh, is so crazy strong, like they hate this intra and extracellular fluid so much that they immediately rejoin, okay, and kind of self-heal that membrane. All right, so that'll do it for chapter 1.4 on membrane transport.